So what have you done over these past few weeks? I've been working away a lot, which is which has actually given me the space I need to work on the episodes. So I've got this series now done. The series is, is penned out. And well, you went shopping? Yes, I went to the Knight's Vault in Edinburgh, which is up at Grass Market. And it is primarily like, well, it is a, it's a, a replica swords and armor shop, like medieval stuff. But they've got a whole Lord of the Rings room. And fuck me. It was amazing. Like, it was just, like, so much merch. And, and like, they, they follow us on Instagram, and, like, they I've messaged them a couple of times, like, just saying, oh, this is cool. I, I keep meaning to stop by because I'm staying really close to, to where, where it is. When I go away, when I messaged them after I'd been, they were like, oh, and if there's any merch you see that you think we should have, just message us and we'll get it in. And, uh, yeah, it's a fucking nerd's paradise. So if you, ever, if you ever find yourself in Edinburgh, go to the Knight's Vault. Like, I'm, I'm not... This isn't sponsored or any way promotion or anything like that. Because I'm, I'm getting fuck all from this. I got some lovely earrings. I got you some uh, Lorien Leaf earrings. Yeah. I got myself a sign for my office that says no admittance except on party business. <laughs> and I got... Uh, actually, I'll show you it now. I'll, I'll get it out. I got a banner to hang up in my office as well. Oh, I didn't see this. Ah, See, there's no... You can hear this. You nev- yeah, you never really tell me the full story of when no, you're purchasing. No, no, I told you I got it. I told you because I phoned you straight after, but I didn't show you it. And I've not took any pictures of it either. But this is a banner to hang on my wall. And it is of... It's uh, it's the banner of Gilgalad. Mm. Which is pretty cool. They had loads of different banners. Like, they didn't have a dwarf one or I would have got that. And they had a Turin one, which he's a dickhead, so <laughs> I didn't I didn't get that one. Um, so I got a Renian Gilgalad, which is pretty cool. Actually, can you hold it up and I'll take a picture? Put it for, for the gram. For the gram. Why don't I actually, like, we could just put it on the wall, straight on the wall. Well, we don't have any nails. We do. Yeah, we're not like... We're not going to do it right now, though, are yeah, we? Yeah, I'm not, not doing it. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, so I visited the Knight's Vault. That was pretty cool. And it's given me the, the, the time, so the time away from recording has given me the ability to write out the, the series on Rohan. Yeah, because you can't get now done in this house. No, you can't. And fuck me. I was not expecting it to be a series on Rohan. I was expecting one episode, maybe two tops, and then it turned into three. And spoiler alert, as we're recording this episode, I'm up to the 12th King of Rohan, and there's 18 of them. So it might even be a four part by the time I'm finished. It's just uh, uh, who knows. We get about an hour for these episodes to record them, and the, so the plan is you'll hear this. Um, I'm probably going to release it like not this Tuesday coming, but the one after, and then that'll see us through like when we're away on holiday, and then um, we'll we'll just start record like we'll start recording them, and then we're going to be about so basically it's going to be about six weeks between us recording an episode and then it being released in the schedule, and that is enough time for me to get a good backlog going which has always been the intention with this podcast. But for the first year, because we're in the second year of the podcast now, the first year we were still, I was finding my feet, figuring out what the fuck's going on, like how do I do a podcast? And then the, and then it was just get episode to episode, like let's just cover some cool base things. But now it's the second year, a bit more established. And I, I, I came to the point where we were, we were doing it episode to episode. And I was like, I don't have the time i want to dedicate to this mm. so i needed to give myself a breather yeah and that was so you know if you listen to, well i hope you listen to this but you, you'll only know it's a break of maybe four weeks or so but that four weeks actually gives me weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks away for content because it's not the recording them that's the hard part it's never that it's like it's just me and you sitting having a conversation then i edit it which isn't i'm not a very good editor so it doesn't take me very long <laughs> <laughs> but it's the it's the giving it it's given it the research that it deserves and that I know I'm capable of. And and to be honest, like there's so many YouTube channels and other podcasts I know who go through this type of thing as well. Yeah. Where you get to a certain point and you're like, I can't compromise my quality just to get an episode out. Yeah. And I, I know that sounds a bit like fucking high and mighty of me, but um, considering we, we've got... A f- What's interesting with us, we've got quite a small, but I would describe them as like a fairly dedicated audience. Like, there's people I speak to. I'd rather to. have quality than quantity. Yeah, yeah. And there, there is people, like, I speak to pretty much every day. Yeah. Who it is a lovely community. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. And you're worshipped as, like, some kind of fucking idol. It's weird. I, I think you're a cunt. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
No, oh, it's it's nice though, because um, as time goes on though, like I talk to more and more like people in the Tolkien space, mm. and there's one who is a very well known creator on YouTube, who he sent me a couple of advanced clips of some of his latest episodes, and it's fucking amazing. Like, and it's nice that I can have these conversations. So that that's pretty cool. So that that's anyway. Sorry, we're just we're just kind of rambling about general podcast stuff. Oh, just on, life in, in other general. news, yeah. um, what about, what else have you been doing with your time? Oh, I've been running, yeah, yeah. Still training for that half marathon. Exceeded uh, your target. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Oh, my God, yes. That's, that's before, like, family and friends have done it, like, yes. people who done it. <laughs> Absol- no, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I did the 12-hour live stream. I, I think I think that must have been after the Balrogs episode was released. Yeah. yeah. So I did the I did the twelve hour live stream where I stayed awake for twelve hours playing Lord of the Rings games. And it was fantastic. And what was really nice was there was someone there every step of the way. There was always someone there. And it was absolutely amazing. Like it was fucking hard to stay awake for twelve hours because I'd been up since four. Yeah, with but the you baby. were never on your own. No, well, I'd been up since four the day before with the baby, then I had an hour and a half nap before I started and then I, I went to bed at like half past seven the next morning so I was very very tired but it, it was proper special like having people there like just to talk to even just people just like kind of encouraging me yeah um there was there were the the so there was basically there was two shifts there was the Europeans and the like, <laughs> North Americans so there, there, were, there was people who and um, so there was like nimble Lim, who is uh, a Swedish woman and she was there along with um, two guys I work with. You know them, I was talking about them. And they were there until about one o'clock in the morning. Plum and egg. And that was a Well, Nimble, actually. She was there until about three or four, right? Um, and, and then she was just, like, she was on the t- same time zone as me. So I was like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> but then, like, um, Americans jumped in. Like, there's Emma, who's uh, the Unquenchable Hobbit yeah. on Instagram. So I got that really cozy Instagram. Yeah. Uh, I love there, that. There was Red Moors, who, um, she was one of the first people to join, like, the, the podcast's Discord server. Oh, cool. um, And then while we were talking, I, I told her about, like, the, the book club yeah. one. Uh, then there was there was someone who I'd not interacted with a great deal, kind of, um, who was called Nicole. But I knew, like, I'd seen her name come up with the podcast, and I, I'd, I had spoken to her a couple of times. And she was there for a lot of the time as well. Um, yeah, it, it was it was quite. An, oh God, I can't. Yeah, Nikki obviously as well. Nikki was there. Nikki's always there. Nikki's always around. <laughs> um, Nikki, she said she put um, she put the pot. She said she put the the Twitch stream on in the background while she went to sleep, like just as background noise, because she's she lives in uh, Holland. Is it? Yeah, it's Holland. Yeah. It, but and then um, one of the jokes was don't play like a Nazgul sound at three o'clock in the morning. But then coincidentally, I was playing Return of the King from the GameCube at about half past three, and there's an episode in Osgiliath. Uh, the, sorry, one of the levels is where you're playing as Sam in Osgiliath, and, uh, <laughs> and one of the Nazgul's are just screeching about the whole time. So I was just like, oh, fuck. But anyway, I don't think there was any adverse effects. So we raised about £170. Which was fantastic for t- so it was you know it was I think it was above minimum wage if I was getting paid by the hour, <laughs> which was class uh, and, and led to the next day very quickly. Oh, sorry, within a couple of days, I absolutely smashed the fundraising goal. So I've increased that fundraising goal just to see how much we can raise because my work will match it. Yeah. So yeah, all round great one. The next uh, the next one on the cards is I think it's going to be the twenty second of June. I'll be doing a charity one shot game. Oh, for nice. uh, for for D and D, well, it's Pathfinder two e, but D and D's the the, the colloquialism. Like everyone knows, a tabletop RPG, you just call it D and D, right? And we, I've already started planning that, and there's going to be six players, and the idea is you pay to play, so you make a donation to the Just Give In, just out of the kindness of your heart, please, and then we're all going to have a, a good session that we're going to live stream on Twitch as well, and it's set in the first age of Middle Earth, and it's um if you don't know the story that well, then you'll learn things as you go. And if you do, it's all nice little nods because I purposefully crafted a scenario that does not make any waves or interfere with anything in the story because I fucking hate that <laughs> with, with TV shows and that. Is that there's some there's gaps exist in the gaps? Mm. Do you know what I mean? So the the charity game that I'm organising is based around 
a group of adventurers who were sent into Nandungotheb, which is a, an area of Beleriand that we don't know anything about anywhere. So, yeah. It's, uh, Exciting. Hell yeah. If you're just joining us for the first time, welcome. If you're not joining us for the first time, then welcome back. But this is a drunk history of Middle Earth. This is something I should have done at the beginning. <laughs> but this is a podcast where me and my wife, Rebecca, talk about all things Middle Earth as if we're sat in a pub. We break down, uh, I do research and I break down everything to do with Tolkien in a very easy and accessible way. It's, you know, it's as if we're sat in a pub talking about it. Yeah. Now, behind the scenes, we're going to record another episode tomorrow night and that'll be Rohan part two. And we will probably be drunk to that, for that, sorry. However, I wasn't going to do it tonight, even though Becca was trying to tempt me because I'm going for a very long run tomorrow and I need my wits about me to not die. <laughs> and if only episode one ever makes it to air because it's my last wish, then you'll know that I died after recording episode one on my long run the following day. And in which case you'll forever be left with a, a one part episode on Rohan as the last one of the podcast. <laughs> Unless Becca takes up my notes and uh, tries to carry it on, which, you know, fair dues. Right. Shall we talk about the horsies? Yes, please. Let's talk about Rohan now. I my little pony. <laughs> don't you summon my the little pony? Don't summon the brownies. Uh... So our, our daughter watches My Little Pony. She fucking loves it. My little and, and pony. And I'm just completely. I'm I'm forever tainted, knowing that there's absolute fucking degenerates out there like to pretend to be horses. Chris Chan likes My Little Pony. You know that's uh, Chris Ka- Chan can go and fuck himself uh, or his mom. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's horrible. Right. <laughs> so, before we talk about Rohan, though, we got to talk about the land itself. Mm. And that's what we're going to really focus on today, because it's got a very, very long history before it even becomes Rohan. But all of it is... So, we're going to be talking about agriculture? No. We're not going to be talking about horses? We're not going to be talking about the horses too much, because the horses come with the people, and the people aren't here yet. Oh. Although, I think... We'll get to it, but there is uh, there there is a, there's a myth actually mm. about horses in Juicy. Rohan. So, what do you know about Rohan before we start? That they are horsemen. Mm-hmm. Yes. Very loyal. Exceptionally. That is it. Very handsome. Indubitably. <laughs> yes. Wear pointy hats. Yeah. Yeah. Helmets. Rough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like to ride in long lines. <laughs> what, what would the military term be for the people who ride horses? I can't think. It's, I've gone ca- ca- cavalry. Cavalry, yeah. Yeah, I should have. That should have been straight at the forefront. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all that I know. Okay, cool. Again, yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. That's more than fine. So, Rohan is a fairly young kingdom of humans. A lot of blonde people. Yes. They are a fairly young kingdom on the northern borders of Gondor. They are known as the Horse Lords, and they are famous for their cavalry. Now, interestingly, this was my first bit of the information where I was like, oh, yeah. While they are famous for their military might, especially during you know the War of the Ring and the best part of Return of the King, especially when we saw in Royal Albert Hall when they, they do the, the, the charge of the Rahiram, but... They're mainly a people of, of shepherds and farmers. They are descendants of a nomadic people, the, the Aeotheod and the Northmen. And they, they just, you know, they grow and tend their flocks and crops when they're not fighting. So the kingdom of Rohan is comprised of lots of grass and flatlands with hills. Imagine that like fucking Windows XP or Windows Vista background of yeah. the Green Hills. That's Rohan. So there's lots of pastures, lush, tall grasslands, massive plains, rolling hills, just a lovely... The only thing I don't like... Lots of wind. That's, I, do you know, that's why we're married. <laughs> I, was just, I was just about to say that. That's the thing I don't like about the, the Peter Jackson films is that it just makes me think... It's very windy. Yeah. So, one of the similes used about the land of Rohan is that it's like seas of grass. 
Yeah. That's how big and expensive. That. Yeah. You know, when we walked um, Apollo all that time and it was, um, we were on like a friend dog walk. Oh, yeah. And, and would Bramble jump. and Apollo were yeah. jumping through the field. But as the field was getting blown by the wind, yeah. it looked like an ocean. Yes. And they were jumping up, like their ears flapping yeah. and stuff. That was so good. Yeah. Oh. Rest in peace, little doggos. Yeah. Both of them are dead yeah. now. Jesus. Oh. Yes, it's so. When Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli yeah. were chasing the Urukai, they came upon Rohan suddenly, mm-hmm. and that wasn't an accidental. Say, like, oh, they suddenly came upon Rohan. The borders of certain parts of Rohan are so sharp that it, you do you like one minute you you're not in Rohan, the next you are, and you fucking know it. Yeah. So they appeared in Rohan from a place called the East Wall. Which is where Emin Muil, the you know the jagged labyrinth of razor sharp rocks. That, is that like Emmental. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Real ones know that this is the second time she's made that fucking joke. <laughs> it was about a year ago, but I remember. <laughs> Pain in the I'm consistent. Ass. You are. You are consistently shit. <laughs> right. I'm going to turn the levels back up. We're just going to have to laugh to the side so it doesn't keep clipping. <laughs> right. So. When Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli come upon Rohan, they wipe it off and apologize. <laughs> <laughs> so, the description of so the description we get of Rohan is lovely, and I'm going to read from the book here. At the bottom, they came with a strange suddenness on the grass of Rohan. It swelled like a green sea up to the very foot of the Emin Wheel. The falling stream vanished into a deep growth of cresses and water plants and they could hear it tinkling away in green tunnels down the long, gentle slopes towards the fens of the Entwash Vale far away. They seemed to have left winter clinging to the hills behind. Here the air, the air was softer and warmer, and faintly scented, as if spring was already stirring and the sap was flowing again in herb and leaf. Legolas took a deep breath, like one that drinks a great drought, draught after a long thirst in barren places. Ah! The green smell, he said, it is much better than sleep. Let us run. Light feet may run swiftly here, said Aragorn, more swiftly maybe than iron-shod orcs. Now we have a chance to lessen their lead. And as the first description of the lands of Rohan, I think that's bloody beautiful, to be fair. Like, it does sound... Because, so we, we have a stream near us where we think it's amazing that that crest grows there. Yeah. And I, I, so, yeah, I, I can understand what Tolkien. I, I, I can understand. And muscles. Yes, and muscles. Mm, no. There is muscles. Uh, the yeah. freshwater ones. Mm. There's always loads of muscle shells. There Unless is. Unless some random person it's, uh, or an uh, otter is getting given a bag of muscles and it's sitting next to that. We still need strain. to. We still need to solve this one because that's like CSI seafood. <laughs> I'm not quite sure where those muscle shells are coming from. I, I don't know. I'm starting to think like Big Farm. No. It's like Big Farmer, but it's just farmers. Mm. Big Farm is, is something to do with it. Uh, anyway. Right. <gasps> what if it's in the fertilizer? It's not. They'd be crushed. Oh, right. Okay. Right. Anyway. So, Rohan sounds idyllic. And the main borders were set by the White Mountains in the south, the Misty Mountains in the north, uh, and uh, in the northwest, sorry, the River Eisen and the River Adorn in the west, which uh, formed like a um, like. Do you know that shape where it's like greater than? Mm-hmm. Is that greater than? Is it that yeah. way? It's greater than the two rivers where they meet. That's like a that's like a, a border, and then it goes back as a wedge. Okay. I hope to God that, I, I, that description was appalling. That was bad. Even so, just you show me with your hands. Yes. So a sideways triangle. Where two rivers meet, <laughs> the point at which two rivers meet forms the very, the very, very, very Tip. edge of the western border of Rohan. Okay. And as you work backwards, that's the, the rest of the land. So, the River Eisen and the River Adorn in the west provides the border there. The Great River Anduin in the east, which we know the Anduin is the main river in Middle Earth. It's fucking huge. It's called the Great River. And then the River Entwash plays a massive role in the region because it, it comes down out of Fangorn and it splits Rohan into the East Fold and the West Fold. 
and the east is called uh, the east mnet and the west is called the west mnet and mnet means plane in rohanese so it's just like the east plane and the west plane right okay and the entwash divides them at the ma- <laughs> this isn't even rohan but i just laughed like a little girl when i read it at the mouth of the entwash so the entwash goes all the way through rohan mm-hmm. and then comes to its 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 mouth and at the mouth of rivers you normally have like bogs and, and stuff and like swamps and stuff there is a little place on the map called wet wang <laughs> that's number wang that's number wang <laughs> three no three that's number wang <laughs> so I, i'm just I'm, I'm just i'm just immature enough that i laughed like fuck at wet wang <laughs> wet wang wet wang <laughs> and wet wang is it's a marsh it's a big marsh and the sindarin name is nindalf and both names mean wet flat though I, I, Sorry. I, I prefer wet wang yeah i love wet flats but you know i'm not you gonna prefer call, wet wangs. i'm never gonna call it yeah, i love i love that when wet wangs go into wet flats <laughs> but i'm never gonna refer to it as nindalf that's a pussy move <laughs> right so the, the 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 history of Rohan. So I want to make it clear, the history of Rohan is relatively short in terms of Middle Earth. Right, it's a span of about five hundred years, within fucking six thousand maybe, if you take the the rising of the sun. But the history before that is a lot longer. So before we know it as Rohan, it was a land called the Kalinarthon. And it's one of those cases where... doesn't have the same ring. DH DH is a th sound, like Mytheros. Mm. So, Kalinathon. Kalinathon was part of Gondor and was settled by Gondorians for most of its history. That's why it's, it's still the northern borders of Gondor. It used to be Gondor. And most of the old things in Rohan were built by the Gondorians and they were maintained by them up to a certain point. But... Eventually, the Gondorians became great allies with tribes of humans from the north of the world. And one of these tribes of people was called the Aeotheod. And this would prove exceptionally useful because the Aeotheod would eventually migrate and become the Rohirrim after a certain, a, a long period of time and some pretty fucking solid friendships. Okay. So, we're going to talk about the history of Kalinathon before we get to the history of Rohan, because it's the same land, but we need to understand where it come from, where did it go, where did it come from, Cotton Eye Joe. So, <laughs> this is, we're going to we're gonna touch upon so many other things, right? That, so, this is a warning for everyone. If, this is what happens, these jokes are what happens. When you don't get out. Yeah, no, that's not the warning. <laughs> the, the the warning, kind of the soft warning here is, if you don't understand something, don't worry. Chances are you're not meant to. And if it's important to the story, I'll mention it briefly. But also take comfort knowing that I plan to stick around this area of history for a while. So I will explain things. And, and that's, I hope to God that doesn't sound... It's like college and university. Yeah, I hope it doesn't sound more patronising. It, it's not meant to be patronising at all, but there is a lot of things that this brushes up against that are big, massive subjects by themselves. That we're going to elaborate on. Yes. So, the first mention of the Kalinathon is in the second age of Middle-earth, right? So, we're already way past the, the War of Wrath. Mel- Morgoth's gone. Sauron's starting to rise again. Gil-Galad, topical with the banner, Gil-Galad sends a letter to the fifth king of Numenor. So, we're already well into Numenor now. Tar Meneldor. And asks for his help, right? He asks for the help of the fifth king of of Numenor. Gil-Galad says that there is something I need help with and Tar Meneldor doesn't know how to respond to it. So, Tar Meneldor has a son and his son is one of the main character is one of the main characters in one of my favorite stories to come out of the second age and it's not a happy story and it's not it's it's a it's a it's a love story gone wrong 
that tale is called the tale of Aldarian and Arendis. And Aldarian is the son in question, right? So in the year 882 of the Second Age, Gil-galad warns Tar Meneldor that a servant of Morgoth, he, nobody knows who it is yet, but he says a servant of Sauron, uh, sorry, sorry, a servant of Morgoth was arising in the east of Middle Earth and would invade the Westlands. Now Gil-galad sees this coming far off and he says, we need to band together and we need to, to, to get our defences because there is war coming, right? Mm. So Gil-galad says, the land that this servant of Morgoth will come through is a gap between the southern end of the Misty Mountains and the White Mountains. And this land was called the Kalinathon. So Gil-galad sent a letter to Numenor, which is an island well off the coast, saying we need help to strengthen a port called Vinyalonda. That would allow them to defend southern Eriador. Now, Eriador being the country where the Shire is, yeah. right? That's where, that was called Eregi- uh, Eriador, which mm-hmm. is where, you know, they, they used to be the kingdoms of elves and stuff. So, the story is massively long in its own right. And that's the story of Aldarion and Arendis. And I won't go into it here, but that's the first time we saw mention of this land that we would become, that would come to be known as Rohan. And as a, just from this letter being sent, Tar Meneldor doesn't know how to react. He doesn't know what to do. So much so that he ends up abdicating his throne and gives it to his son. Okay. And that's, and that's believe it or not, that is already near the end of the story that I love. That's near the end of Aldarion Horrendous. It's fucking horrible, <laughs> but fantastic. You're really selling it's, it. It. Um, if I was to if I was to pick one story in Tolkien that would become a stage play. It would be Aldarian and Arendis because there is a fantastic monologue about that Tal Meneldor. It is Shakespearean. It is Shakespearean. So Tal Meneldor does this whole monologue about how he's not sure how to to deal with it and what to do as a king, and it's just powerful stuff. Anyway, right. So that was the year eight eight two. We fast forward then almost eight hundred years. So Gil Galad saw this coming far off. In the year sixteen ninety five of the Second Age. Sauron does come through the Kalinathon. He comes through the land, as Gil-galad had said, and the War of Elves and Sauron is kicking off. So Sauron got fucked up by the Elves and the Numenorians who helped him. uh, Helped the Elves, sorry. And he fled back to Mordor. But on his way back, he was nearly completely destroyed in the east of the Kalinathon. So... We see the Kalinathon firstly as a land that is an avenue for attack to the southern tip of Eriador. Then we also see it as a place that Sauron nearly died on his way back to, to Mordor. That's pretty significant. Oh, pretty significant, yeah. So after that, the next significant thing we see is in the Third Age. And this is now we fast forward like over a thousand years. So there is some racist shenanigans here. Because in the Third Age, 1437, 1,437 of the Third Age, there's been a civil war in Gondor called the Kinstrife. In fact, Jesus Christ, it's actually it's nearly like fucking 3,000 years later. Or two and a half thousand years later-ish. Anyway, there's been a civil war in Gondor called the Kinstrife. And... This is, again, it's massive subjects that I'm just brushing over. But there was a king called Eldakar who was deposed. Like, he he was, he, his throne was, he was tricked out from under him. He was, he was betrayed. Hello, my name is Eldakar. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, Eldakar went away. And when he came back, the people of the Kalinathon flocked to him in support. Mm. He fought back to, to get his fought to get his throne back and the people of the Kalinathon were with him and they won. Nice. So the kin strives a whole thing anyway, but basically it's uh it, it's Gondor who were descent of Numenor. They were being racist towards Eldakar because his dad had um had a child with a woman who wasn't of Numenor. She was one of the other quote unquote lesser humans. Rude. And they were worried that the lifespan of Eldakar would be reduced, and that mm. you'd basically be um, you'd be race mixing yourself yeah. into extinction. Turns out Eldakar 
was no longer, no less long, no less long lived than anyone else, mm. and he was just was as just fierce. Ignorance. He was a true fucking warrior. Uh, so he proved them wrong because even though he was half Northman and half Gondorian, he fought for his throne back and he fucking won. So fair dues, yeah. Mm. Stupid racists. So then the uh, 1636 of the Third Age to 1637, there was a very bad plague. And we're, we're 200 years past the Kinstrife now, right? This plague most likely originated from a lab in China. <laughs> no, this plague originated from Sauron, okay, in the east. It, and it's most likely from Sauron because it coincides with him getting stronger in Mirkwood. And everyone in Middle Earth pretty much was was impacted by this. Like people really fucking suffered. Kalinathon people included. Moving along, about four hundred, uh, and then we move along to the year two thousand of the the third the third age. So about three hundred years later, before we get the next significant event in the Kalinathon, there is a period of about four hundred years where the population of the Kalinathon begins to decline. So this is a, a, a trend over time, over 400 years. The population moves east because what's happening here in this time is Gondor is being attacked constantly. And a lot of these attacks are coming from the east. And the Anduin is a natural defensive line because it's the river. So Gondor starts to move its soldiers east. And another thing that happens here that you'd be familiar with from our Witch King episode is around this time is the last king of Gondor before Aragorn is taken into Minas Morgul and never seen again. So if you want to know more about that, go and listen to our Witch King episode. So now, not only is Gondor being attacked constantly, it's got not got a king and the stewards begin to rule. So it's ripe for the taking. It's it's a tough time, yeah. So because of this, fortresses that had been built by the Gondorians in their heyday are no longer maintained. Okay? And a couple of these are the Hornburg, which is for now called the Soothburg, which just means South Fortress, and Isengard, which has got the Tower of Orthanc. Okay? They aren't maintained by the Gondorians, and instead the Gondorians leave them to the local chieftains. And these are, or are the ancestors of, the Dunlendings, who would later become Rohan's enemies. Okay? Yeah. So the the chieftains mix... uh, Sorry, so yeah, left to local chieftains. So some of the Kalinarthon people stay, and they mix with the Dunlendings. Uh, And, you know, you've got them doing their thing. Um, What... The, this is really here, is this is the origin of the beef between the Dunlendings and the Rohirrim. Because when the Rohirrim come, they try and drive out the Dunlendings. Now, the Dunlendings think, this is our fucking home. We've been here for hundreds of years, and now some cunt from Gondor just gives gives these fucking people from the north, like the lands as we don't exist. Which I can kind of see the, the, the why the Dunlendings have like such big beef with Rohan. Yeah, fair dues. But the Dunlendings would forever plague Rohan as until the War of the Ring, as whenever Rohan was weak or looking the other way, they'd start shit. They, they'd always try and attack them. And we'll see in probably the, th- the second or third episode of the series, we're going to see a time when they really were successful in doing this. Mm. So now we're seeing, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing a gradual what it was and now the decline already because Gondor is uh, so it's very much part of Gondor so as Gondor suffers so does this like you've got to shrink your borders to maintain your defences so then in the year 2489 of the third age again we're still about 500 years away from the war of the ring a bit longer a steward comes to power called Kyrian in Gondor and he is I think he's the 12th steward Anyway, he orders that more fortresses along the river Anduin be manned as he fears an attack from the east. And so all Gondor can really do is... uh, There's further decline, and all he can really do is defend its borders. But this is the key bit, right? Because Kyrian was right, an attack was coming. And the people called the Balkoth 
from the east who serve Sauron joined forces with orcs from the Misty Mountains to the northwest and they continued to grow. They didn't do any direct attacks. They started to marshal their forces and they grew and they grew and they grew. So Gondor, not for the first time or last time in its history, can see a shadow on its doorstep and the shadow's getting a lot bigger. And the shadow's Sauron, fuck me. You know, same guy. So, in the year 2510, about 20 years after Kyrian comes to power, Gondor's about to be attacked, right? It's it's imminent. So Kyrian is looking for allies, and throughout its history, Gondor became allies with the Northmen, the, the nomadic tribes of the north of Middle-earth. And so Kyrian sent seven riders north to try and make contact with their old, their old allies. Yeah. One rider survives the journey, right? And, and at first I was like, surely seven people could slip through. And then I looked at the distance. This journey was 950 miles. Yeah. And Jesus. Oh, than they yeah. Used to. Oh, yeah. It's the Aetheod are far, far, far north. So one rider gets there. He gets to the, the capital of, that the Aetheod keep called Framsburg, which is their capital. And the rider is called Borondir. And that's the tradition of people in Gondor having really fucking historical names. Um, because Boron was one of the the houses of the Edain, like one of the, the, the first humans that we mm. see. And I think he was like one of the ancestors of Beren, who at the tale of Beren and Luthien is a very, very important human. So, you know, a, a namesake and a half there. So the leader of these people of the Eorthiod, called Eorl the Young, E-O-R-L. Why do you think he's called Eorl the Young? Do you think um, he might be quite youthful? Yeah, kind of. Do you it's... think he's like maybe not a man yet? No, no, he is a man. He is. Uh, he got his name because of... He's the younger one. He came to power. <laughs> no, he came to power when he who was 16 because his dad died. So, we're going to get a little bit hoarse here. Mm-hmm. His dad, Eol's dad... Do you want a drink? <laughs> Eol's dad died when he tried to tame a horse. The horse threw him from his back and he hit his head on a stone and he died, right? Mm. And the legend says that this horse was the first of the Meras, the amazing horses. And this is from whom Shadowfax and Theoden's horse Snowman are descended from. And the legend goes that the Meras were traditionally said to have been brought brought east by Oromir of the Valar from Aman. So Oromir the Valar is said to have, been, have brought these horses across the sea himself. They're very intelligent creatures, and they live as long as humans. Mm. The only exception to them bearing kings or princes is Gandalf, who is a Maiar anyway, so he's like a, he's a, an angelic being. But it's said that the Mieres would only ever bear kings or princes of Rohan. And this all comes from when Eol's father was killed by the horse. It, well, So Eol's father was called Laod, and when he tried to tame the horse... Felaroth, which is the horse's name, he threw him from his back and, and Leod died. And the guy fell her off. <laughs> the guy. <laughs> oh, that's so fucking stupid. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So the guy fell off. You, you definitely deep dive into your research because I just pick all these <laughs> jokes, but you don't see them until you actually yeah no, that's good that's it's why there's two of us <laughs> so his dad died El came to power and what El did was he went looking for the horse right and he said to the horse is it as intelligent as I'm a human f- well no he said to Ooh, he said you're getting a whipping no no no, no. He, he basically he so Eol tamed the horse and he said to the horse you owe me a life debt you killed my my father mm. your your doom is and that's that word again doom is your your doom is to carry me now for the rest of your life do all my chores and Felleroth agreed 
Like yeah. he he so he uh, uh, he um, he gave his consent to this, right? Mm. And so Aeol rode Felleroth for for the rest of their lives, right? And that's how the tradition of the horses, the Meras, being rode by the kings of the Rohirrim started. That's nice. And it was this Aeol the Young who answered the message of Barondia. Now it's said that Barondia carried with him a red arrow as a sign that Gondor needed help. And again, in the Lord of the Rings, in the War of the Ring, Theoden is presented with a red arrow while they're already on their way to help Gondor. Mm. And that's the symbol of aid between the houses. So like, it's, a, it's, it's a, one of those things that's got so much history behind it. So Aeol the Young led his warriors south to Gondor's aid, 950 miles there's, I think I saw a figure, there's about six or 7,000 of them who get through. And if it is that, then it, again, it comes back to the War of the Ring where it's 6,000, just over 6,000 riders of the Rohirrim who again come to Gondor's aid in the Third Age in the same way. And then after that, in Lord of the Rings, the Oath is renewed. The oath of Aeol is renewed between Aomer and Aragorn, and this battle here results in the oath of Aeol anyway. So it's that historical parallels, like a small number of riders making a huge difference in Gondor's fight. Yeah. So they show up unexpectedly to the battle, and they pin the Belkoth and the Orcs. Kyrian wasn't expecting them because he didn't think his message would get there in time. So it shows that how how well Barondir did. And unfortunately, he's, he's, you know, his six companions who died, his six colleagues, they help Gondor win, right? Yeah. They they avoid destruction. So Kyrian says, thank you. Meet me at this certain place in three months. And he asks Aeol to meet him at the Mering stream three months later. So when they meet, Kyrian shows Aeol a secret. And that secret is the tomb of Elendil, the first High King of Gondor and Arnor. Do you know Isildur's dad? The so Isildur, uh, uh, sorry, Elendil and his kids and seven ships escaped. Was it seven ships? Shit, it might be three ships. Anyway, Elendil and his people escape from Numenor during the downfall, and they bec- he becomes the first High King of Gondor and and Arnor, the north yeah. and the south. So. To meet on the tomb of Elendil is a massive sign of respect. And this hill that they meet on is called Amon Anwar, which means the Hill of Awe, like A-W-E. Yeah. And so they pledge their undying friendships between their peoples. Like, you know, the Rohirrim, uh, well, the Aeothiod at this time, will always be friends of Gondor and will always come to each other's aid. Gondor will always be friends to the Aeothiod. We will always defend each other to the last. Whenever you need aid, we'll be there. Which, again, we see in Lord of the Rings, right? Yeah. And as an extra part of this, Kyrian, it's a very friendly move. It's, it's a massive friendly. They give the Kalinarthon, to the Rohirrim, and they swear this oath, the oath of Aeol, and that their friend, their nations will always be friends. Now, it's a massively, like, decent move to do, but now that we're saying it, I'm wondering, like, for Kyrian, how much of this is a practical move as well? Because Gondor shrank. It can't defend its northern territory. Like, it can't defend the Kalinarthon anymore. It, it doesn't have the, the numbers, and we've seen with the Orcs and the Balkoth that they were susceptible to attack, right? Even if you just man the, the fortresses on the Anduin. Well, that's just good kingship, isn't it? Well, yeah, well, like stewardship. Stewardship, yeah. But, yeah, I just wonder how much of it was a practical, like a pragmatic gift as well. Like, you can have all of this land, because it's very fertile and as well. And you protect it yeah, exactly. and be the first barrier. Well, yeah, I just, wa- gone I, I just wonder if there was some ulterior motive there. But not super-duper ulterior, but it's more like just a... It oh, makes, that was it, a nice... Perk. It, it just it makes sense kind yeah. of thing like it just it makes sense and so that is where the Kalinarthon becomes known in Gondor as Rohan and the Aeothiod from the north now start to migrate south to live there and the Ro 
uh, sorry, in Gondor, it becomes known as Rohan, and they become known as the Rohirrim. And to the Aeothiod, it becomes known as the Mark of the Riders, or the Mark, or the Riddermark. And that is exactly where Kalinarthon becomes Rohan. And that is the, the history of the Kalinarthon. But, should we have a look at some of the famous landmarks? A yes. couple of the, the couple of the famous ones. So not all of the landmarks were Gondorian because uh, the, there's a couple of places like Dunharrow, for example, that was allegedly built long before by men who served Sauron. But most of the landmarks in Rohan are of Gondorian in origin. But let's talk about Dunharrow first. So what Dunharrow is is um so in the films, you know when Theoden looks down off that massive cliff into the, the like the camp below and they say like six thousand spears, less than yeah. half of what I'd hoped for. Yeah. That's Dunharrow. And and Dunharrow is a massive flat piece of land at the top of a cliff. And it's got a very narrow, very windy road that's very difficult to get up. Yeah. And you'll see like dotted around Rohan are places that in times of war, famine, emergency they can flee to, and yeah. Dunharrow is one of these places. So, it's a flat stretch of ground at the top of a high cliff hundreds of feet above the valley of Harrowdale, and it was a prime defensive position, which, again, Rohan excels at. And this Dunharrow was surrounded on three sides by mountains, and it was a place for armies to camp or refugees to flee to. And as we'll see during the reign of King Helm, Hammerhand, it acts as both. It's a place for refugees and an army. So the the name Dunharrow in Old English is the it's a weird little equivalent. So with with the Rohirrim, lots of it is Old English. Mm. There's ve- barely any like Elven influence. There's a couple of Sindarin words, but it's mainly Old English. And the name of Dunharrow is an Old English equivalent of, of equivalent, sorry, of Dunhag, which means the heathen the heathen fane on the hillside, and fane meaning temple. And that, to me, shows that at least to the Rohirrim, there's a belief there that it was built by these people like out of the dark past. Yeah. And that is actually a bit of a, a like, to me, it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a callback because there's certain elements of Tolkien that are holdovers from his earlier versions of the mythology. So like Nandun Gothab, for example, right, in Beleriand, where Ungoliant mates with like other spiders, and that's where Shelob is from. That originally was filled with forgotten gods that were older than the Valar and strange humans and like real like eldritch shit. And Dunharrow is also one of these places where it's quite eldritch. And anyway, one of the mountains Talking about haunted eldritch things. One of the three mountains was a haunted mountain called the Dwimmerberg. And you'll have seen this in the films where Aragorn yeah. and, and Gimli and Legolas go. And the paths of the dead below the haunted mountain is accessed by following a road from Dunharrow to the Dimult, which is a wood made up of fir trees that are like dark, like black trees. It's very foreboding. So in these dark trees... The road to the Paths of the Dead is marked by two rows of standing stones either side. So it's very, very spooky. It's a very Mm -hmm. spooky place. And then eventually, if you follow this road, you come up with a single standing stone that points you to the dark doors of the dead. And through these doors, we know what lies. It's the men who never fought for Isildur in the War of the Last Alliance, even though they swore upon the Stone of Erech. Is it just them down there then? It's it's a whole army, yeah. It's a whole army that swore they'd Ignore fight. Ignore the dead. Well, they kill. Well, they do kill people, and we'll see. Because I like to tell you a little story in a second. But it's mainly the army that was cursed by a sealed or. And the reason they were cursed, they weren't cursed by a sealed or himself. They cursed themselves because they swore, and I think they swore upon the name of Eru, that they would fight. And when they didn't they weren't able to find peace. And as we've seen before, Oaths have a lot of power in Middle-earth. Like, if you swear an Oath, like with the the Oath of Feanor, if you swear an Oath, you are bound to it. 
and that's why Elrond at the council, where, where the, the, the ring's about to set out, he says, I hold you to no oaths except that which like you'll swear yourself. Like you, you won't make them swear any oath. And Elrond especially knows because his parents were killed. I, th- I think Elrond's parents were killed. His parents, I think, were killed because of the oath of Feanor. They were killed by Feanor's like, army. Uh, sorry, the sons of Feanor. So again, I'd need to fact check that about Elrond, but I know he suffered because of the oath of Feanor. So it's really fucking bad. So, we'll talk about um, the, 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 the paths of the dead. We know what's under there, but who built Dunharrow? And like I said, it might be the evil men out of time, but there's also some speculation that the Druidine built Dunharrow, and these are the Warsers, the Pukul men, the, the strange... So, so hobbits are a subset of humans. Mm. Druid, the Druidine are also a subset of humans, and they have special powers. Like, they can make stone carvings that seem to come to life to protect things when they need to. And they've got, like, their own... It's very Icelandic, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's really cool. They've got their own, like, um, like, their own mythology, and I'd love to talk about them, but not today. It's all a mystery, Dunharrow, essentially. But let the, the history of it is, uh, is pretty interesting. So when the Rohirrim settled the region, they looked for strong places to take refuge in. Naturally, that's that's what you want to do. So they found like pretty much three that I'm going to talk about just now. So we'll talk about Dunharrow first. And the story goes that King Brego, the second king of Rohan... Now in the films, there's a nod to this because Aragorn's horse is called Brego who's named after this king. Don't think it's the same in the books, um, but yeah, the second king of Rohan has a son, talk about um, Norse influence, his son's called Baldur, and Baldur is later given the title of Baldur the Hapless. So Brego and his son found Dunharrow. There they met an old man who was guarding the Dark Door, and Theoden tells this story in Lord of the Rings in, in the chapter The Muster of Rohan. Brego and his son Balder climbed the stair of the hold and so came before the door. On the threshold sat an old man, aged beyond guess of years. Tall and kingly he had been, but now he was withered and he was withered as an old stone. Indeed, for stone they took him, for he moved not, and he said no word, until they sought to pass him by and enter. And then a voice came out of him, as it were out of the ground, and to their amaze it spoke in a western tongue. The way is shut. Then they halted and looked at him and saw that he lived still. But he did not look at them. The way is shut, his voice said again. It was made by those who are dead and the dead keep it until the time comes. The way is shut. And when will that time be, said Balder. But no answer did he ever get, for the old man died in that hour and fell upon his face. And no other tidings of the ancient dwellers of the mountains have our folk ever learned. And that part must have stuck with Balder, because uh, later on, when the the Golden Hall of Meadowseld, which uh, is where we see in Lord of the Rings where they go meet him, meet uh, Theoden for the first time, Brego is the king who built that hall. And at the the feast to mark the finishing of it, Balder, in his pride, states that he would tread the paths of the dead. And will you now? He's never seen again. He's never seen again, and his dad, King Brego, dies of grief, but we'll, we'll cover that next episode when we start to talk about the kings. Um, oh, it's so bad. But yeah, that's about as much as I can say uh, about Dunharrow. But just as an aside, when they first come to Rohan, the Aeotheod, Aeol, builds a town called Aldeberg, which is the first capital of Rohan. And it's not until the time of King Brego that Edoras becomes the capital of Rohan, which is where it stays, and he's the one who builds Meadowseld. But Aldberg it means old fortress in Old English, mm-hmm. uh, and that was the first capital of Rohan. <sighs> anyway, uh, in the year... Fun, ooh, little interesting fact, absolutely probably not related, but in the same year that Baldur disappears, 2570 of the Third Age... That's pretty much exactly the same time that dragons appear again in the north and start to fuck with the dwarves. So maybe it's just um, a bit of evil returning to the land and the symptoms of it. But yeah, that's about as much as I can say about Tolkien. He just, he loves weird shit happening in the mountains. Just so seems... are there any other landmarks? Yeah, yeah, there's two more. Yeah, oh. just thought we'd talk about Dunharrow first. Yeah, just... 
It's, uh, yeah, he just loves weird shit happening. It makes me think he would have loved Appalachia <laughs> in America. Like, there's always weird shit happening there, except it's, main, it's mainly cousins fucking, but you know, other weird shit. Anyway, let's talk about the Hornberg, which is Helm's Deep. Uh, and there's also all oh, thank we'll get to that afterwards. So, the Rohirrim called the Hornberg by two different names, depending on which part was being discussed. And prior to it being called the Hornberg, it was called the Soothberg, which I think means South Fortress. Anyway, so they separated into two parts. So the Glittering Caves, which is the mount- in the mountains behind the actual fortress, was called Glemshrafu, which means Caves of Radiance in Old English. And we've been, uh, it's Cheddar Gorge. Yeah. It's, uh, it's based on that, allegedly. And I can understand why it's fucking beautiful inside. And the fortress itself is called Soothberg, which means South Fortress, like I mentioned. But the Gondorian name for the Hornberg, I'm just going to call it the Hornberg or Helm's Deep just for sake of it. I know he's not been born yet, but, you know. The Gondorian name for the Hornberg was Aglarond, which means glittering cavern in Sindarin. And there's not a massive deal to, to say about that. Um, but then we'll finish off just with Orthanc. Now, Orthanc was built by either the Gondorians or the Numenorians, and it was made of, like, massive bits of welded stone, which nobody could replicate, and it was pretty much impregnable and unassailable. And we'll see later on in Rohan's history, before Saruman, it is still a problem if the wrong person is in there. Because Isengard is... A circle of about a, of a mile in, uh, I think it's radius, not diameter. Anyway, it's a mile around. It's, it's a circle with a mile. And in the middle stands Orthanc. And Orthanc is a pretty much impregnable tower. And that's where one of the stones, uh, one of the Palantiri rested. And Sauron came along in, in the year 27 something. And he took ownership of the uh, residence there. But before that, they did have problems with the Dunlendings being in there because, again, um, the local chieftains bred with the Dunlendings and, and you know, they, they, they took over. Um, just a bit of language, though, is that Orthanc in Old English means iron enclosure. And in Sindarin, it's called Angrenos, which means iron fortress. And I thought that was a nice little uh, a nice little one to, to finish off on. But that, that's the brief history of the Kalinarthon before it becomes Rohan. Okay. So we've covered the land. Now, next episode, we're going to cover the people. We're going to start to talk about the kings of Rohan and the major events of Rohan's history. And then, most likely, on into a third episode, because in Rohan, the way that the kingdom is set up is that in its history, it's had three lines of kings and a line is ended when a direct descendant is not able to take the throne and instead it jumps to then like the oldest male heir. Yeah. And I, I think it's primogeniture, um, but that's when you call a second line so that, you know, roughly we get to the end of Helm Hammerhand, everyone in his family dies, jumps to his nephew, all the way to Theoden, Theoden dies, jumps to his nephew, Aema. Yeah. So that's the three different lines of kings. And yeah, that's uh, that. That's Rohan. Well, that's the Kalinarthon becoming Rohan, and that's the end of part one. How did you find all that? Very interesting. I thought it was absolutely fascinating. And I, I just, there's just anything. What I'm finding out is that when you come to the third age, I'm used to, to the first and second age where it's like, Millions died in like one sentence or something. It's like thousands died anyway. But um, with the third age, Tolkien went into a lot more detail, like a ridiculously lot more detail. So it's it for me, it's like being a kid in a candy shop, realizing just how much I could, how much material I've got. Yeah. Instead of having to go digging far and wide, it's just kind of like I've got to discard some of the fluff, which is unusual for me. I, I enjoyed it though. I'm, I'm glad you did as well. I like a bit of terrain. Yeah, it's um, it's very fertile land as well. Like so, it's just a lot of farmers. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, right. Well, that's us, and uh, we will see you next episode with part two. So that's uh, goodbye from me, Chris, and goodbye from Rebecca. Bye. Bye. Bye.